Well, I want to set the table. This is the public policy session, and we're going to discuss the new reality of internet censorship. It's an honor to have Congressman Blackburn with us. I'm grateful for the panel you're going to hear in a few minutes. And I'm looking forward to the, to the discussion. But I, I really think it's uh, important to talk about why NRB, National Religious Broadcasters, entering into, we're entering into this. It's because this is our 75th year. We're launching the 75th anniversary at this convention. And our third mission point is defending free speech. You may not know that 75 years ago, around the time of the Second World War, evangelical radio programs were the most popular programs on American airwaves. The Federal Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, unhappy with the success of evangelical ministers, pressed the broadcasting companies, the radio stations, to take off the evangelicals and to put on responsible ministers for free, mainline, leaning left. Well, that was the reason and the rationale for the beginning of NRB. These evangelical leaders got together to say, we ought to have a place on the public square. The playing field ought to be level for evangelicals. Well, here we are. We got back on the air, and we've been on the air for 75 years. Well, there's a new threat now. NRB members, like every other communicator, engage with the constituents using the amazing and innovative tools of the Internet. The story of those tools as they've developed is a testament to the power of free enterprise and innovation. And we're thankful for the big companies that have made this a booming success, a powerful internet ecosystem. However, we are alarmed at the increasing incidences of censorship of conservative and Christian viewpoints by tech giants like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Apple. It all began in 2010 when they took down Chuck Colson's Manhattan Declaration. Facebook has put down Mike Huckabee. Twitter has sought to muzzle the voice of a sitting member of the U.S. Congress. And even the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, has expressed concern about this. And we're going to hear from all of these people in this next hour. It's amazing. So for this reason, NRB is launching Internet Freedom Watch. And we are watching. And if you go to the website, internetfreedomwatch.org, we're documenting these cases of censorship. And if you experience this kind of digital media censorship, we want you to enter your story. And there's a place on this web page for you to enter it. And we have a timeline, a chronology for you to see it and to show it to others. We are calling on Silicon Valley to embrace First Amendment principles. So we're going to hear from Congressman Blackburn and Tony Perkins is going to then set a context for the good things that have been happening. And then Todd Starnes is going to lead a panel to dig down and to show you, though, the depths of this challenge and this problem. So first, we are honored to be visited this morning by Congressman Marsha Blackburn. Congressman Blackburn was elected to the U.S. House in 2002. She represents Tennessee's seven, seventh district here, right here in the Nashville area. This is your house. She is a champion for life and for liberty, as well as fiscal common sense and government accountability. Blackburn has often been selected by her colleagues to lead. She is a leader. She's chaired the House Select 
investigative panel on infant lives. And it issued a comprehensive report dealing its, detailing its findings and recommendations regarding abortion and the selling of tissue from aborted babies. She also chaired the House Communications and Technology Subcommittee. Well, one of her priorities is the defense of internet freedom at home and abroad. It's interesting that her commitment to life and liberty has led some, to led to some uh, entanglements with big tech leaders. And actually, she's gonna tell us some about that in a moment. Let's welcome to the stage, the Honorable Marsha Blackburn. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will tell you, I am absolutely delighted to be here and to join you and so pleased that once again you are in Nashville for your convention. I know that just like every year that you come here, you get lost. You don't know if you're in the Delta or the Cascades or um, Whiskey Junction, whatever it's called over there. Uh, but it is uh, a great hotel to get lost in, isn't it? And you are always welcomed here in Tennessee. So thank you very much uh, for being here. This is going to be a great panel. And I do wanna cover a few things with you before Tony will talk with you a little bit about the way they're utilizing social media, and then Todd's panel is going to be fantastic for you. I think what it will do is highlight some opportunities and kind of put in place some of the pitfalls that you need to be aware of. But these are all good awarenesses and recognitions as you all are celebrating your 75th year. And then also as you are beginning to launch this internet watch. Now, uh, let, let's do this. Let's start with talking about the select committee that I chaired in Congress. Uh, everyone remembers the summer of 2015 when the Center for Medical Progress came out with the videos and showed the interaction between some Planned Parenthood officials and those that were selling uh, organs that were harvested from aborted babies. And there was evidence in those videos that showed that federal laws may have been broken. Because of that, then Speaker Boehner established and the House passed a resolution, H.R. 463, that established the Select Investigative Panel. What it did was to give us the calendar year of 2016 to look into what was happening with this. Because there's actually a federal statute. It is uh, US Code 42, 289G2. And that stipulates that you can transfer or you can donate, but you cannot receive one penny of profit from the sale of body parts, fetal body parts. So I was selected and asked to chair this select committee and to work within this frame. So we established a, a great group, hired a great team, a staff director who had experience with trafficking, a forensic accountant, who knew how to dig below the numbers. We set our hearings first to look at the ethics of the situation and then to look at the business relationship that was there because through the 40 subpoenas that I issued, we found that there were some abortion clinics that had actually contracted, contracted with fetal body part sellers and what they were doing was putting these body parts, the gestational age, the body part, whether it was a heart, a lung, a liver, a uh, scalp, uh, on a website and people could order 
the part at a certain gestational age, pay for it with a credit card, move to checkout, select a delivery method, and then receive that shipment. Because of the hearings and the subpoenas, I issued 15 criminal referrals in December of 2016 as we wound down our work. Now, here's the part you probably don't know unless you're listening to Tony's show or uh, Shannon Bream, uh, one of these shows. Here's what you don't know. Eleven of those criminal referrals were to states' attorneys general. We've had favorable action in New Mexico and also in California based on that. We had a clinic shut down in California. Four of those were federal referrals that went to the U.S. Department of Justice. And today, because of those criminal referrals that we issued, DOJ has taken up all four of those federal referrals. The FBI has taken up all 15 criminal referrals. And Planned Parenthood and body part sellers now are under investigation by the Department of Justice and the FBI. And I tell you this simply because I imagine that was news to you. How many of you are hearing that for the first time? I want you to raise your hands. Think about that. You're hearing it for the first time. Unless you were following me on my website or on my Facebook, and by the way, all of you ought to be doing that, <laughs> or you were listening to Tony on the day that I was on his show, you probably wouldn't know that. But if it were a conservative group that had a net worth of a billion dollars that was being investigated by the Department of Justice and the FBI, what would you be hearing? It would be day one of the whatever scandal, day 20 of the whatever scandal. So is there a bias? I'll let you decide that. Is there a censorship by choice of what the reporters, the news directors decide to report on? So you can see how, um, how you just don't hear a lot about those things. And this investigation is a great example of that. If it were one of our pro-life organizations or Right to Life or Susan B. Anthony being investigated by the DOJ and FBI, you'd hear about it every single day. Every single day. Now, I know that Vice President Pence was here with you earlier this week. I was at the White House yesterday and had a chance to visit with him for just a moment. And I know we talked to you a little bit about how this is the most pro-life administration in uh, our nation's history. It's amazing the support that we have seen. The House has done a lot of work this year, too. Of course, we're still waiting on the Senate to take up our bills. But those are not getting a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of press coverage. We have uh, strengthened the Born Alive Infants Act. We have passed a measure that would prohibit uh, entities that do abortions from receiving those Title X funds. Uh, the Pain Capable Child Act has gone to the Senate, so the House is standing steadfast and is passing these issues, but there again, you are not going to hear a, a lot about that. Let me talk a little bit about what we're doing at Energy and Commerce because it's going to tie into the panel that is going to follow, follow on. And I have to say a heartfelt thank you for you all putting the emphasis on uh, these issues. And <clears throat> at Energy and Commerce, 
we are continuing to work and as chairman of communications and technology i'm continuing to work on how we protect consumers online and i refer to it as the virtual you you in your presence online and making certain that consumers are given the toolbox they need to protect your virtual you because it is still it is still you uh, look at data we are yet to pass data security legislation in Congress out of either chamber and there is a stat I looked at this this week 90% of all the data that is floating out there on the internet has been generated in the last two years. So think about how much of your life is going on to the internet and is floating out there. We have done uh, some good work in the post data breach era. 2014 was the year of the breach but it's only gotten worse since then. And many of you may have been affected by the scope of the, um, of the Equifax breach. And here is how it happens. And I just want to read through this with you so that you get a feel for how these data breaches happen and somebody gets in and gets your information and creates an alternative presence to you and they become the virtual you. And I'm going to quote to you for a second. Data aggregation, whether it be from open source intelligence sources alone or combined with data breaches is enormously powerful as it can result in a very comprehensive personal profile being built. One system may leak an email address and a name in the user interface. Another has a data breach and exposes their home address, then that's combined with other open source intelligence source information that list a profile photo and a date of birth. Suddenly, many of the ingredients required to identify and indeed impersonate the individual's identity are readily available. Now, this is, when is Congress going to do something about this and put in place protections for you? We have had a data security bill. We've been trying to pass it for the last three years. But what we as consumers in this virtual space have to realize is that the weakest point in the security system may actually be between you and that keyboard with the information that you are putting into that virtual space. Now, data security is the cousin of privacy. And there are laws that exist in the physical space that protect your privacy. These are overseen by the Federal Trade Commission. And you have certain rights of privacy. Many of you have signed privacy in agreements. When you go to the hospital, there's a form they give you called HIPAA. And this is your health care privacy. What we have found out is that many times this does not end up applying in the virtual space. And this is why you have to be careful with your encryption. And as we have looked at the Federal Communications Commission reauthorization, and certainly you've heard from Chairman Pai, and as we're looking at the Federal Trade Commission, we're trying to keep everybody in their right line, lanes because it's imperative that you have the strength and protection of those privacy laws behind you, whether you're in the physical space or in the virtual space. I have a bill, the Browser Act, which will uh, authorize the FTC to enforce information privacy protections that require broadband internet access services and certain websites or mobile applications providing subscription, account purchase, or search engine services to allow users 
to opt in or to opt out on the use of their disclosure or access to their personal information. Now, the reason this is important, your access to your internet, your internet service provider, it may be AT&T or Verizon or Charter or any other of a number of entities, but you click on that to open your internet system, but then what do you do? You click on the search engine, Google or Yahoo or Bing or DuckDuck, you click on a search engine. Now, that is where the bulk of the exposure and the data capture happens because you've clicked on that search engine and then what begins to take place? They follow you you get pop-ups, you get spam. Why is this happening? It is because they are accessing and following you. You have a Google Home, you have an Alexa. What is happening? It is recording, it is following you. Strengthening those privacy rules so that you can opt out and block all of that and say, no, you Google, you Facebook, you YouTube, any of these, they're called edge providers. You are not entitled to use my virtual you for your benefit and for your profit. You, the individual, have the right to privacy. And those are, this is a bill that we are trying to get passed. And as you all watch what is happening on the internet, of course, we appreciate your help with data security and with privacy. Now let's look a little bit at uh, what has happened around censorship. And of course, Chairman Pai and I have both been those that were hit with censorship. Uh, mine occurred when I put up um, an announcement video for a, for a race, a uh, campaign. And in that, I talked about leading the U.S. House as we worked through the process of ending the sale of baby body parts. I received a notice from Twitter that I would not be allowed to use, and I've got this uh, language here, it was deemed an inflammatory statement that is likely to evoke a strong negative reaction. That's what they chose to tell me. That is how pro-life language was treated. I said, you know, to me, harvesting uh, fetuses, uh, harvesting and selling, baby body parts evokes a very strong negative reaction. So in my Southern mama, chief mama in charge style, I stood my ground. And eventually, yes, Twitter relented. But it was only after Sheryl Sandberg, who is um, the Facebook chief operating officer was asked a question if Twitter was right or wrong. And she said, even though she politically disagrees with me, they were wrong. Because when you censor free speech for one, you censor it for all. <laughs> so the video went back up on Twitter. So well, that is one, and that's the kind of um, that's the kind of stand that we have to take when tech oversteps. I have friends here in Tennessee who produce Christian movies, who produce Christian content, and many times YouTube has blocked their videos. They've blocked their trailers. They have censored that content. And it is just not right. You are right to call it out. 
I love the fact that you all have developed a timeline, gives me something that I can use in committee, and chronicles the way free speech is being hampered. So uh, let me just give you a couple more things that we are doing at communications and technology. <clears throat> uh, you're going to hear a good bit, people will say, oh, we've got to preserve net neutrality. These are the 2015 rules, the Obama era internet regulation rules. And people will say, oh, we have to preserve net neutrality. And they're conflating broadband expansion and net neutrality. Well, let me tell you something. The internet was not broken in 2015 and it did not need the federal government's help. And what we do need on this issue is regulatory certainty. Uh, Chairman Pai was right to rescind the net neutrality order, the 2015 order. I have the Open Internet Preservation Act, which will take care of the two things people generally mention, no blocking, no throttling. Those are things we are for. It does not deal with paid prioritization because some of our individuals that are working in healthcare technology, autonomous vehicles, content production, uh, bringing call centers back on U.S. shores into our rural communities, they say, don't ban paid prioritization. That deserves a more thoughtful and thorough discussion, and we're going to have that discussion. But we're pushing forward with the open internet order so that your ISPs and your edge providers cannot block, cannot throttle. We think that is the right and correct step. And we're working as the House and the Senate and with the FCC as we view these issues. Um, what you will see us do is continue to put the uh, attention on individual privacy. I'm also working on a bill for student privacy. When children are at school and making certain that parents have the ability to protect the information on their children. So this is a little bit of what we're doing. You will hear us talk about broadband expansion. It is a goal to get broadband across the country and to close the digital divide and preserve jobs and health care and additional educational opportunities for rural America. It will be to preserve a free and open internet, but do it in a conservative way, not an Obama era way with net neutrality rules. It will be to give you the tools you need to protect your data and to preserve your privacy in the online space. And it will be to continue to hold big tech accountable so that they do not censor and they do not block information. And we as conservatives have the opportunity to talk to the American people about the good things that are happening. Things such as having Planned Parenthood and body part sellers under a federal investigation. Thank you all so much for letting me be with you today.